Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending this session on emerging markets. I am Mr. Chan Zi, Head of Research from ICPAS and facilitator for this session. The title of the session is Expanding Your Business Map, Emerging Markets. We have with us two invited experts to share their knowledge on and experiences in such markets. We have the distinguished Mr. Benedict So, Executive Chairman of Kingsman Creative. Kingsman Creative is a SGX main board listed company that specializes in exhibition, retail interiors, museum, and thematic design and production. Kingsman has presence in seven or more emerging markets around Asia and beyond. And also our other guest is the esteemed Mr. Law Chunming of IE Singapore, Group Director of the China Group, where he oversees the agency's China operations comprising of nine centers. We start off with a presentation by Mr. Law on China, in particular the market conditions in central China. Next, Mr. So will present and share his perspective of venturing into emerging markets through the lens of the corporate and risk taker. Hence, we start with Mr. Law. Mr. Law, please. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. So, Zi, and ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor for me here to share with you some of our insights on central China and how IE Singapore can work together, together with all of you uh, in your internationalization path. This will be the agenda for today. I will quickly run through the first few items and then we will focus a bit more on the latter half of the presentation. First, let me go into a quick overview of China's economy. China's economy has been growing at an average of about 10% over the past 10 years. Okay? You can see that uh, today, China is really a very big, major economic power. In essence, they are actually the second largest economy in the world now, after the USA. So the prediction is that China could be the world's largest economy within 10 years, right? But currently, we can see that they are facing uh, two major issues, if we can put it very simply. One, will such rapid growth for the past 10, 20 years still be sustainable in the future? Second, in view of the rapid growth, China is facing some pressures. You know, can China manage to overcome some of these pressures? Now, from IE Singapore perspective, we are cautiously optimistic. We see good, sustainable, long-term growth for China. Besides the fact that China has a strong uh, foreign reserve uh, backup, the government is relatively rich at the central level. The other important thing is that there is a growing middle class that will boost domestic consumption in China. At the same time, the government is embarking on an aggressive balanced development mode. That means from the coastal maturing first tier cities towards the central and the western regions, which are further inland. However, amid the uncertainties uh, in view of the current global economic situation, GDP growth rate for China this year has been targeted at less than 8%. To be exact, it's 7.5%. However, uh, as you know, in China, uh, most of the time, in fact, all the time, they always exceed their targets. So, we feel that China economy will remain resilient for this year and there are three primary reasons why we think so. Firstly, of urbanization. There has been a large shift from the rural areas to the urban centers. The farmers are moving from the rural areas to the urban population centers where they can enjoy better services better government support and better amenities. This trend will continue. So as cities get created, as the cities get bigger, 
there's a huge demand for infrastructure as well as other related services. And this spells a lot of opportunities for Singapore companies. Second, the consumerism will continue to grow. Previously, China depends a lot on the export-led economic engine. But over the past five years, the government has been trying to increase the co domestic consumption engine. And with rising wages contributing to rising disposable incomes, as well as the businessmen getting very rich, you have hear stories about them going overseas to buy branded products, luxurious items, and all sorts of consumption are actually happening in China now. So this, again, spells a lot of opportunities for our companies in the services area. Last but not least, the balanced development strategy taken by the central government to shift a lot of economic growth focus to the central and the western <coughs> regions, the second and third tier cities, this again will spell a lot of opportunities. Not only will investors be attracted uh, towards the inland regions, but at the same time, spending, investment will continue to feature very strongly in the emerging regions. As such, we are quite optimistic that China economy will remain resilient this year. Now, let's, let me move on to the rise of central China. Uh, it is a part of where we call the inland provinces. So looking at the current economy map of China now, so where's the money? Uh, I mentioned earlier that we all know about Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou and Shenzhen, which are part of the eastern seaboard, the matured uh, first tier regions and the cities. They actually contribute about 60 to 70 percent of GDP with more than 50 percent of the population. But if you look at the central and the western, they contribute another very big chunk of both the population and the GDP as well. So as central government shift inland their investment and development strategies, the other part of China, where I suppose most people are not so familiar, will be very important to us as we seek continued growth opportunities in China. So you look at the FDI flows, Central China has been attracting rising, uh, rising trend of uh, FDI inflows, which means foreigners or foreign investors are already making their move. So as such, we need to move fast as well. So among the top 15 provinces in China, you can see that four of them are actually in Central China. Uh, four of them are actually in Central China. Yeah. Yeah, you have the Henan, the Hubei, Hunan, as well as the Anhui. Okay. So for today's session discussion, I would like to talk about the two Hu brothers, Hubei and Hunan. The reason why we are interested in them is that looking at their GDP structural makeup, we can see that among the central China provinces, they actually have a high proportion of tertiary sectors. Tertiary refers to services, uh, uh, secondary refers to manufacturing, and primary refers to agriculture. This is how the Chinese government defined their GDP makeup. So they have high tertiary uh, sector makeup, and the, lead, the local leaders there are actually sent from central, which means uh, the government is placing a lot of political uh, emphasis on the two uh, provinces. And at the same time, their provincial cities of Wuhan and, and Changsha actually featured top among the top 15 Chinese cities as well uh, in China. And good news to all of us, Silk Air has actually launched direct flights uh, to both Wuhan and Changsha. Uh, Changsha was launched last year, Wuhan will be launched next month. So I'm happy to share that IE Singapore actually worked closely with Silk Air uh, to make this thing happen. <laughs> So with the direct connections, basically, uh, we hope to see more potential collaboration between companies on both sides. And hey, it's easier for all of us to travel there now without having transit elsewhere, you know. Okay, let me first talk about Hubei. 
We see Hubei as a strategic pivot of central China. Uh, basically, they have defined themselves uh, to do to focus on environmental friendly, resource saving industries, new materials, high tech, and so on. And Hubei actually has a very good industrial base. And more importantly, Hubei occupy a strategic location along the Yangtze River. In fact, the middle part of the Yangtze River. Wuhan is the provincial capital of Hubei. And it is the only uh, central China city in the top 15 ranking. Uh, basically, for Wuhan, we look at 1 plus 8. The interesting thing about Wuhan city is that it's surrounded by 8 other uh, what we call secondary cities, that means uh, satellite cities. So when we look at Wuhan, we are talking about a 1 plus 8 um, strategy, city cluster. So I was told by the locals that actually all the major expressways and even railways and transport links, actually among the 8 of them, they do not have direct connectivity. They all have to go through Wuhan. So, for, for example, if you want to travel from uh, Erzhou uh, to Huangshi, you need to go through Wuhan. So that's where we see that Wuhan is very important as a transport and logistics hub. And they do have, and the city has big plans to be a major transportation hub in central China. <coughs> uh, I'm sure you know about the high speed in China. So basically, the Wuhan Guangzhou was among the first to be opened. A 1,000 kilometer distance uh, journey shortened to three hours plus, and is very comfortable, as good as your Shinkansen or your TGV. I mean, uh, bearing the accident that happened last year. <laughs> but at the same time, the Wuhan River Port okay, is also a very strategic location because it straddles the middle part of the Yangtze. So for the connection to Shanghai, which is in the downstream part of the Yangtze, Wuhan will play a very important role. And they have big plans. They have something called the Wuhan New Port Plan uh, strategy, where they want to grow the Wuhan New Port to 100 million tons port with 10 million TEUs a year. And they have a lot of um, policies and uh, attractive uh, programs in place to make this happen. And um, from IE's perspective, we are already facilitating Singapore companies to explore projects in Wuhan Newport. So besides the logistics part of it, as part of their overall development of the Wuhan Newport, they are going to build a lot of industrial parks, a lot of satellite towns, they will require a lot of environmental services and so on and so on. So there are huge opportunities here as well. Looking at the industrialization, uh, we mentioned earlier that Wuhan is a very industrial city. They have something called the Wuhan Donghu Gao uh, which is very famous for opto electronics. In fact, uh, we were told that it is one of the largest opto electronic base in the world. And this is now further enhanced by their recent forays into biotech, into new media, and so on. So this is the place to go if you are looking to site a manufacturing facility. Next, we look at Wuhan, uh, Hunan, the second brother of the Hu family. Now, Hu, Hunan is called Xiang. Uh, if you go to Hunan, you look at the car plates, it's actually Xiang. So Xiang Cai and, and some of this is actually referring to Hunanese cuisine. So how do we see Hunan? Hunan is uh, different from Hubei. Hunan has a lot of soft power. Uh, I don't know how much you all watch Chinese TV, but Hunan Wei Si is one of the most famous you know, um, TV stations in China. Uh, I think Pu Pu Jing Xing is uh, made by them, you know. If you have watched, you know, Pu Pu Jing Xing, the Scarlet Heart, right, I think it's in English. Yeah, so, and at the same time, it's also a home to many of uh, China famous leaders, like Mao Zedong came from Hunan. Yeah, and they have abundant tourism resources, like Zhang Jiajie, which I'm sure some of you have gone to. And uh, 
At the same time, uh, they also position themselves as a gateway uh, uh, towards the, their own region. So for Hunan, we will look at Changsha. And we see Changsha spearheading Hunan's growth. And Changsha, again, we don't look at Changsha city alone. We look at the Changzhu Tan cluster, means Changsha, uh, Zhuzhou, and Xiangtan. So the three cities will form a, a, a quite a significant city cluster by itself. And uh, looking at that, uh, Changsha's forte may not necessarily be in manufacturing, but more of tertiary, which is the services, media, and so on. Let me talk a bit more about that. Changsha, we like to see it as a consumer paradise. When I was there for the first time, the officials told me they actually, uh, somebody actually bought in two Bentley. No Bentley, the very luxurious car. And they told me that it was on display in Wuhan for one month, nobody buy. But when it came to Changsha, within three days, it was snapped up. Yeah. So there was a saying, no? in, in Changsha, right, if you give the person $1,000, they will tend to spend $1,005. Yeah. So that's how much they love to spend. That's why we call them the consumer paradise in central China. And their per capita expenditure or consumption actually is very high. It ranks among uh, the top 10 uh, cities in China. So eating, entertainment, of course shopping, uh, which I mentioned earlier. So now they are going to build a lot of shopping mall. Uh, at currently, they do not have really first class type of shopping mall at or Ion or even Vivo City. But lots of people are going in now. Um, the developers from Hong Kong, um, from China itself and so on. So we do foresee that this part um, will grow very fast. And this again will present a lot of retail opportunities for our companies. Whether you are in food and beverage or whether you are in lifestyle products. So after hearing this, I would like to move into a tale of two cities, Wuhan and Changsha. Basically, how do they compare? You know, let's, let's try to summarize it up in a, in a nutshell. I'm not going to run through the entire list with you. you. You can have a look at it. But essentially, for Wuhan, uh, they tend to be more uh, government-led, uh, state-owned enterprise-driven economy. You know, uh, maybe more institutionalized, more formal. Whereas in Changsha, it's more private entrepreneur that uh, tend to be more laissez fair, more loose, uh, and then uh, maybe a bit more relaxed and so on. And the people there are looking at different things. In Wuhan, the people are very hungry, they are very aggressive. You know, they, so in terms of salary, they will ask for a lot more. Uh, they will work for you, but they will ask for a lot more. But in Changsha, people want a more work-life balance style lifestyle, you know, because they like to enjoy life, like to entertain, you know. So it's interesting uh, to see the two cities, how they, how, they, how they position themselves differently in central China. Okay, after hearing so much, uh, what are the challenges uh, that you will face if you operate in central China, in particular if we look at Wuhan and Changsha? First and foremost, uh, or even though labor or manpower costs are relatively lower uh, in central China, but the reason why it's lower could be because a lot of the top talents have already moved to the coastal region, right? Because they develop first, they are more mature. So in terms of skill level, in terms of mindset, so you will, you will need to do a lot of training. So if you are moving in there, although you can get very... Uh, relatively lower labor costs, uh, these are some of the issues that you have to take note. You have to provide more training, more guidance, vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a, a similar level uh, worker or, or, or talent in the coastal region. So business cost is the same thing. Yes, it's, it's lower, land is cheaper, rental is cheaper. For example, our office in Wuhan, I think the rental is only about one third of the Shanghai office. Yeah, one third or maybe even one quarter. So that's a lot of difference, you know. But of course, uh, together with that, you will tend uh, to face infrastructural certain issues. You may not be so well linked. So if you are doing manufacturing, and if you are manufacturing for export, then you may have really think twice. Because 
your transport cost of bringing in the raw materials if you bring in from overseas and the transport cost to ship the products out again. Uh, the other thing is about business mindset. Uh. So the local government in central China may, may be more inward looking. Uh, reason being they may not have as much contact or exposure to foreign influence compared to the coastal region officials. So as such, you, we might need to spend more time uh, I wouldn't want to use the word educate, uh, but we may need to spend more time to market or to sell our unique value proposition to them. So you need to spend more time on that. And it is true, uh, during our interactions or engagement with the central government, uh, central China officials, we do uh, note that uh, we need to spend quite a bit of effort to explain to them and also to try to sell them our ideas and concepts. So it is true. And of course, uh, if they are not so well known uh, or not so uh, in depth, have an in depth understanding about foreign, don't talk about Singapore. Uh. So the Singapore they know could be the Singapore that's 10 to 15 years ago, you know. Uh, they may not know actually that uh, we have also progressed very fast. We have also advanced very fast. Many things have happened in Singapore because they will just think that we may be like, you know, some place where we stagnate and they actually grew very fast. So they did not, they may not know about that. So. Usually, the first thing we try to do is try to invite them to Singapore, where they have a look about where we are now today and how advanced we are. So, looking at the opportunities, beside those we mentioned earlier, the other thing is that with the strong influx of FDI expected okay, in the coming years, uh, a lot of um, foreign investors will go in and they will need to have a lot of services and supporting infrastructure supporting uh, companies uh, to help them you see so that's where we think that this is the right time for us to look at central china uh, singapore companies uh, we have always been working very closely with the mncs we know how they think how they work what are their requirements very strict standards on quality and, and integrity and upholds many type of um, you know uh, qualifications and and, and things. So we are in a good position uh, to service and to help these MNCs as they move inland. So we have to be able to catch the wave at the right time. And of course, uh, if we look at a particular opportunity area, let's look at urbanization. We shared that in China, the trend is moving very fast in this field. And in central China, it will be moving even faster. Their cities will grow from 8 to 10 million, 10 to 12 million, and so on. And all these will require a lot of urban solutions as well as consumption-driven uh, services. And this is where we come in. And let me show you some examples of how Singapore companies have been tapping on some of these things. Uh, our, our more bigger and famous companies like Capital Land, you know, and we have the smaller companies like Angro, Beast Point, and we talk about Silk Air, uh, who take, have seen the trend coming and want to provide this service to all of you, you know, as you explore Central China. Okay, after all the Goyo about Central China, now it's the next set of Goyo about IE Singapore. <laughs> Basically, I would like to share with you how IE Singapore, you know, in a very succinct way, can help you and partner you as you embark on your journey uh, towards internationalization. Now, IE Singapore is the leading Singapore government agency responsible for the development of our external economy. Basically, we look at two things. We look at internationalization and trade. Okay, in internationalization, we look at direct investment abroad. We look at export of services. In trade, we look at total exports of goods as well as offshore trade, which I'm sure sort of cover all of what um, all of you are doing. And actually, Singapore, we have seen um, very good growth, both in terms of trade and our internationalization. Yeah. Our trade has grown by a CAGR of 6% over the last 10 years. Offshore trade has grown by 50%, export of services by 12%, and direct investment abroad at 16%, which means uh, today uh, we are making a lot of investments abroad. Okay, and this is likely, this trend is likely to continue. So uh, the trend about us setting up in the foreign 
or emerging markets and then deliver, delivering our products and services through our offshore presence. These are some of the numbers that you can see. I will not go into them. So from IE Singapore's perspective and from your perspective, why do we need to think so much about the external economy? I mean, this could be motherhood, uh, by the way. I'm sure all of you know. I mean, Singapore, 5 million population, you know, what's after that? So the, work, the sky's the limit where we go out. You know, China, 1.3 billion. India, 1.2 billion. ASEAN, 600 million. And, and these numbers are astronomical, staggering. So if we do well overseas, we can replicate and can scale up very fast. Globalization brings many uh, benefits to a firm. You know, some firms go globalization because they want to seek resources, some because they want to seek uh, technologies, some want to seek markets. And being able to operate across markets will give us a lot of uh, benefits. Chief among them is averaging costs, leveraging on talent, you know, uh, getting new market insights, coming out with innovations. You know. So some of these things we think are very important. And among the global markets today, IE Singapore strongly recommends that you explore the emerging markets. You know, this can be within our region, like ASEAN and China, could be further apart, like Middle East Africa, or even further, like Latin America. And this is something that has been endorsed at the highest level, you know, in our Economic Strategies Committee uh, in 2010. You know, we have decided that we must grow a diverse and resilient ecosystem of companies, including a stronger base of local companies, with the potential to be leaders in Asia. And all of you are our leaders in Asia, or leaders in the media. Okay, so how can we, in a practical way, help you? Besides our network of overseas officers, currently we have more than 35, uh, so we have very good uh, in-depth market knowledge, uh, good connections to, uh, in the ground, and we hear a lot, and we like to share a lot with you as well. That's what I'm doing here today. But essentially, when we talk about going global at the firm level, we need to build capabilities. And there are, there are several core capabilities that IE Singapore has identified uh, from our interaction with our companies that we need to build. This can range from design, you know, to branding, to manpower, and so on. And we do have schemes to help you. So for example, we have the SME Market Access Program, which will help you with market access. We have the Double Tax Deduction Program, which can help you to offset some of your costs as you venture overseas. Now, I'm not going to go through the details, uh, but um, you, know, you can easily uh, look for all these details uh, on our website, uh, or you can call us. And best of all, we love to meet you face to face to talk about this. So in conclusion, uh, IE Singapore is very happy and look forward to working with all of you in the journey to internationalization, to globalization. Thank you for your attention.